all the students from the School of the Arts and also all the students from all the ensembles that are tuning in tonight to gain some really valuable information about something that's going to be important both throughout this pandemic and also throughout your entire musical careers afterwards. Because even once we get to the end of this COVID time period where we're making all sorts of distance videos and having to do our juries over Zoom, um, learning the basics of how to make high quality recordings is something that's a valuable skill for musicians throughout our entire careers. Whether you're making an audition tape uh, or even a mixtape uh, of some demos that you need to send off, or even just doing basic recordings of your practice, learning some techniques and tricks for having to get the best quality sound is I think one of the most valuable things we could cover in a seminar uh, for you during this time. So I'm really excited to welcome Ray Dillard here, a fantastic performing musician, music educator, and above all, sound engineer with incredible wealth of experience in recording many albums, many for percussion, also for a number of other instruments as well. Um, he's recorded at one point over, I think it was 150 albums just of percussion. And that was probably 10 or 15 years ago when he told me that little tidbit. So I don't even, I can't even imagine uh, what the total is now. 222. Well, for many years, uh, percussion and recording engineering in Texas, and has been living in Canada now for several decades and also works closely with Nexus Percussion Ensemble, which has the dubious distinction on campus of playing our last concert before the pandemic started on March 6th last year. He's received Grammy and contributed to Juno nominated projects with many different ensembles. And so um, he's also given this kind of recording workshop in many settings. And I've seen a couple of them. And one thing that's always fascinated me is that it's been very informative, whether you've never done a recording before, or whether you've been doing recording engineering for many, many years, everyone always walks away having learned something really valuable. So throughout the workshop today, what I'm gonna do is I'll be monitoring the chat window for questions. So if you have anything you'd like clarification about or, or another question you'd like to ask, please drop it into the chat window. And then uh, various points in time, he'll check in and I'll read off some questions. If something seems very urgent, I'll sort of jump in and chime in with that uh, then at that point. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Ray to our virtual stage here to give us all information that can help us make better sounding recordings, which will be valuable both throughout the pandemic and the rest of our careers. Thanks, Michael. Uh, it's great to be with all of you tonight uh, from here in Barrie, Ontario, just outside of Barrie in Springwater, to be honest. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's very interesting how we've all had to adapt and adopt new protocols in the last year and change. Um, as Michael mentioned, Nexus's performance at McMaster was indeed our very last performance we have played and uh, who knows, uh, the ensemble is in its 50th year. Uh, if this goes on too much longer, it may be the very last performance we ever play. It's, it's very difficult to know at this point. But uh, nonetheless, it was, a, it was a great experience. And if uh, you have any interest in that performance, uh, Michael could probably share with you some information on a, a video that we made during that at a workshop. Um, over at the live lab that's that's quite nice quite interesting and it's part of a, a a new website that myself and nexus and soul percussion from new york launched called drumming at 50. and it's all about steve reich's monumental work drumming uh, which is an hour-long piece for percussion voice flute and um, it's celebrating its 50th anniversary as is nexus ironically and Russell Hartenberger of Nexus is one of the original performers of the piece with Steve and his ensemble, even to the extent that he was involved with Steve for a year preparing and uh, Steve was writing the piece. So between all of us in Nexus and uh, Steve Reich, we have all a long history with this piece and it's really fun. You should check out that website if you have an interest in that particular piece of Steve's music. So let's talk a little bit about what we're going to do today and, and how we're going to do it. Uh, there will be some video shares going on and there will be in the chat window momentarily there will be an outline that, that looks that has this kind of a format on it. And this outline will be something that you can immediately download should you desire, open in, in Word and start typing notes into if you want to take your own notes. Uh, if you wanted to print it and write notes along, 
that's fine too. You'll have a moment to do that. So um, if Ben, if you can v verify that that's now in the chat, that would be great. I'm kind of watching Ben to get the yeah, high sign. Okay. It's in the chat, fantastic. Uh, there's a couple of things that will make this evening a little more fun for me, <laughs> at least, and that is if you can kind of keep a trigger finger happy for uh, speaking, because there will be points where I simply ask for some visual, some audio feedback, just say something, because uh, it makes me feel a little less uh, isolated here, if you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, the fun part about what we're going to do is, is you're going to get to hear what I'm talking about as much as see words or hear me blab. And I think that's really important because part of this process is about showing you that the most important tool for recording is your ears. And we all have them. <laughs> uh, other than that, it's just simple stuff that you have to learn and or experiment with and or study. But the actual tool that you need the most, you all have. And uh, that's the tool you need to understand the most and how it applies. So if you look at the pay, at the part one concept there, I'm just going to run through this relatively quick. Uh, I want to extend on my own notes. You'll see that my focus is about digital recording not being difficult. And that's my whole point of the whole evening is what we're talking about is not, is not rocket science. It's not SpaceX losing another vehicle on test like they did today. It's, it's something way simpler than that. It's something much more mundane in, in some ways. Um, and that the difficult part of this process is actually playing well and making good music as a player. <laughs> That's the hard part. Recording and capturing it is not that difficult. So let's just talk a little bit about the kind of generic tools that all of us need to understand that might be necessary to record. And of course, one of the first tools that you all probably have really close to you, if it's not in your hand already, already is a phone. Uh, 10 years ago, even, phones were not great uh, candidates for recording. Uh, they've improved dramatically. Uh, to the extent that they're actually, uh, if, you, if you think about it, you know, this entire space could be recorded with a simple phone pretty successfully, which I think is pretty remarkable. If you think about it, I also, by the way, all these weird hand gestures I'm doing is just because my camera has AI in it and, and, and it knows to do certain things when I do certain things. I was also told quite recently by a very good friend of mine who's a retired McDonnell Douglas uh, aerospace engineer in Houston, Texas, and I used to teach his son percussion lessons. He was told, he told me that the common iPhone, and this was in 2019, by the way, had 10 times more computing power than the entire computer system used on the, on the Apollo missions. So you're carrying around a very powerful computer. And if you're not old enough to understand what that meant, read about the Apollo missions. They, they were basically done on a, on a shoestring of a computer. It's pretty remarkable. So I don't discount this device anymore as a recording tool. I'm going to tell you the biggest secret I've found about recording with a phone. Most of your phones, like mine, probably are in a, some sort of a case. The best way to improve the recording with this is to take this off. <laughs> and that's just, a, that's just an unbelievably simple thing. But when you're actually doing audio recording, uh, take the case off for a variety of reasons. The microphones are designed to work with, the, with, with absolutely no impeding the sound coming into the microphone. The second thing that's critically important is to understand where the microphones are, <laughs> okay? And that you can just do with experimenting, you know, scratch around on the phone. They may be in places you didn't think they were, okay? I will just warn you with iPhones that they're not always where you think they are. So understand where the microphone is. So if the phone is your instrument of choice, so be it, that's great. The other thing that a lot of people are now starting to utilize is something like this. This happens to be a Zoom H6. Uh, this is a six channel recorder. It has two inputs on each side in addition to the microphone on the top. It's extremely high quality. Uh, the microphone on the top is a, is a stereo mic that can be easily and quickly replaced just like this with an omnidirectional mic. You can just snap it on. So you've got those options. You've got 
other microphone options that they sell, including a shotgun mic. So if you're doing interviews, it's relatively lightweight considering it's a six channel recorder. I mount it through the adapter on the bottom on my 4K video camera and I have a full six channel audio rig and 4K video rig that I can carry around in a small bag. Uh, it's very high quality, it recording, records up to 96K. And like I said, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not a toy. This is, these are really, really powerful recorders. And this is a big one. They, they obviously make two channel versions and, and I think there's a four channel version. I think there's even an eight channel version now. So the Zoom recorder is, is definitely a contender that you should be looking at. Um, I personally find that pretty remarkable also. And I just saw a question come up about 96K mean. I will talk about that momentarily. So I will kind of keep an eye when I can on, on chat questions that come up. Uh, suffice to say, the, the quality of the recordings I do with this are roughly three and a half times better than an audio CD. That's, that's the short answer for what that meant. And then last but not least, of course, everybody has a laptop or an iPad or some kind of tablet and their interfaces made that work just wonderfully with all of those. And those tools are an infinitely powerful as, as far as being capable of being great recording devices. Uh, the limitations are the processor speed, the amount of RAM, and the size of the hard drive that you have connected to the computer. That's really, that's the limiting factors. If you've got a decent sized hard drive that's fairly fast, a fairly powerful computer with at least eight gigs of RAM, uh, and you've got a good interface, you can make records <laughs> from now till the end of time. It's really that straightforward and easy. So the laptop is, is an incredibly powerful tool, which brings us uh, to the fact that laptops by themselves don't actually do a lot. They have to have software. And the software is, is another stage in the process. We'll talk very briefly about it. But suffice to say that with, with all the different free software as a starting point, you could, you could pay nothing for software and have a decent laptop and you could be recording in very short order. Um, there's, there's great free software titles for everything from Linux machines to PCs to Macs. Doesn't matter what format machine you're on. Um, so that's, that's kind of, that's kind of the, the recording side of it. The, the next quick thing I want to move through is talking about microphones. Uh, before we listen to them, I want to explain a little bit about the differences. The microphone you see here on this stand, I have another version of it, I'll bring up a little closer, is sometimes referred to as a pencil mic. Uh, it's quite small, it's, it is a little larger than a pencil. It's got a preamplifier built into it here, electronics, and it's got a capsule and its nickname is a small diaphragm mic, which means this diaphragm is typically one half inch in diameter or smaller. And that is as opposed to a microphone like this, which has a diaphragm inside here that's about an inch and a quarter in diameter. So you can guess, there's, it's, not, it's not too complicated to guess, this is a large diaphragm mic. This is a small diaphragm mic. Both of these mics are capable of recording basically any source, but some do certain sources better than others. Um, let's talk a little bit about the word transient. Uh, if, I, if I were to ask you, any of you, what the word transient meant in relation to sound, what would you say? Unmuted. Anybody that wants to try to answer that, just unmute and tell me. Transient. Oh, don't be bashful. Not that many. Moving sound. Say that again. Sound that 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 pans or moves away. Uh, no, but that's a good guess. I like it, but that's that's not really what a transient is. Mm -hmm. So, how many of you know what a waveform look like? Just just. Just, to, just tell me you do. Okay, if you don't, if you don't, a waveform looks like a bunch of jiggly lines uh, on, a, on a median line. So it's, it's above and below a median line, squiggly lines make a waveform. So waveforms from certain sounds have incredibly 
fast starts. Uh, think of a woodblock or anything that you strike. The sound starts incredibly fast and then it dies off very quickly. So that is considered a high transient sound. Some microphones do better than others with transients. Phones are not the best <laughs> because it takes a lot of precision to analyze the sound coming into the microphone, transfer it into electronic energy, send it down the line to be preamplified and, and move on down the chain. So microphones that have very good transient response are critically important in the recording process. Uh, I'll demonstrate that in a minute, but suffice to say, condenser microphones like this, large and small, are really good at transients. Now I have another microphone over here, much like you've probably seen before. This is a Shure SM57. It's a workhorse. It's not only a good microphone, but it's so sturdy and robust that you can turn it around backwards and hammer a nail into the stage if your bass drum is slipping around and it won't damage the mic. I'm kind of kidding, but it's extremely, extremely rugged. Uh, it can take a beating. It can go on the road for years on end and, and work perfectly every time. And this microphone is called a dynamic microphone. And a dynamic microphone has no active electronics in it which means that it's all gathering sound through magnetism, reversing the magnetism, throwing it down the line and getting amplified. Uh, it's very simple. It's, they've been around a long, long time. They've actually been around longer than condenser mics. So dynamic mics are very, and very inexpensive. This is, this is about a hundred bucks. Uh, and this is a pro level mic that you would find on snare drum or many other instruments any day of the week at any recording studio or on any live gig. So the dynamic microphone is a very versatile tool that has a great sound, which will, I said, I, we will demonstrate this. The third kind of mic I want to talk about is a ribbon microphone. It's actually, you can't see the ribbon, but there's actually a ribbon in there with magnets uh, and, and, a, and a way of gathering sound pressure by taking a very thinly piece of stretched aluminum, which is vibrating and grabbing that, that vibration as it's moving across the ribbon. Thus it's called the ribbon. Uh, very old style of microphone. They've been around a long, long time. One of the first microphones, carbon microphones like on telephones and ribbon microphones are some of the oldest forms of microphones we know about. Uh, it has some really distinct advantages, which I'll show you in a little bit, but suffice to say it has one huge disadvantage. It needs a lot of amplification to be usable. It by and large itself doesn't create much sound. So it needs these guys right here, let me back out, preamps to make the sound loud enough to be recorded. And that's the trick, the preamp, which is the next thing we're going to talk about. But first, I want to, I want to ask you, how many of you know what a vacuum tube is? Just, just give me a show of hands. I'm not, I'm not sure many of you know what a vacuum tube is. Okay. Prior to transistors, a lot of electronic circuits were created using vacuum tubes. They were glass tubes typically, some were steel, but most of them were glass with a bunch of parts in it, very high voltage and a very pressurized gas inside there it created, it put into the tube in a vacuum that then could do various applications that transistors and capacitors and resistors do now. Believe it or not, inside this microphone, which was built in about 1940, there's a vacuum tube. Right, right in the middle, right down the middle in the tube, there's a vacuum tube. Um, these preamplifiers here, these two, this preamplifier here, and this preamp, you can't really see unless I move my head down here, this preamplifier here has a bunch of tubes in it. Tubes are interesting because they sound beautiful. They are sonically gorgeous sounding. They have huge disadvantages in that they're number one, super high voltage. Number two, they're very, uh, they're not robust. You don't hammer nails into the stage like you do with the SM57. 
with, with the Sure uh, 57, you don't do that with these. They're very, very, very fragile. But they're amazing mics. And often the tubes last 100 years. There are tubes and mics that are now approaching the 100-year mark that are still working perfectly fine. So tube mics are sonically beautiful, but complicated. But I didn't, I didn't want to leave them out of the discussion because I think they're important to understand. And believe it or not, this mic is even older than that one. It's also made in Germany. This mic even has a tube in it. It's a very tiny tube. It's in the, again, it's in the very middle of the body of the mic. It's a very small glass tube. Uh, and the last time I checked, they have a, this tube has not been manufactured since the 1960s. The last time I checked, if you could find a replacement tube for this is about $2,000. Uh, the microphone is, is only valuable, well, it's valuable because of the way it sounds, but it's really valuable because of the tube that's in it. And this is true of a lot of the old mics. Now, the good news is there's modern manufacturing of tubes. So gear like this is starting to become available again on the regular everyday market. So just keep in the back of your mind that tubes are not a bad thing. They're just a little tricky to work with and use. So today we're not gonna do any experimenting with tubes, but I just wanted to make sure, like I said, I wanted them to be in the mix. And I've already alluded to the preamplifiers and their importance because the signal is so incredibly quiet that's picked up by this capsule and sent through these electronics that it's, in, it's incapable of being digitized or recorded, even to analog tape machines, which I still have one over there behind the wall. I can't even record analog tape sound with this microphone without a preamplifier. So just imagine that the signal is so quiet that it has to be amplified prior to being recorded. It's kind of important to understand that. These are traditionally preamps that, that use traditional solid state circuitry, just like a transistor radio or anything else that has either transistors or integrated circuits. There are also preamplifiers like this one that use 100% tube circuitry. And then the one on the bottom I showed you, I had to dip down here. This is called a hybrid preamp. It has both a solid state and a tube side. There are advantages for both. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But I just wanted to give you this quick kind of uh, fast-paced overview look at microphones and preamps. And they're incredibly important because they all have a sonic signature. And no matter if you're recording in our very first stage with this, and the microphone is built in here, or you're recording with this, and your microphones are attached here, or maybe preamplifiers are plugged in here, or you're recording with a laptop with an audio interface, the microphone and preamp are critically important to what you're gonna hear at the end of the day. So the question then comes up. So what does a microphone sound like? And let's assume that we have a microphone and we have a preamp and we have something to record and we've set ourselves up where we've attached the audio interface to the computer and we've got our headphones plugged into the interface and we've got our microphone plugged into the interface and we've got our software installed and we're gonna make some sound now. Let's assume we're that far in. So the next question is, now I've shifted away from my lav, lav mic to this mic. I can verify that. You with me? Yeah? So the interesting thing about that is that this mic is actually, so far as you and I know, this mic is picking up sound in the air and somehow magically it's getting transferred into the digital system and you're hearing it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what this is doing. So first of all, this is a particularly interesting microphone because it's, I said, a condenser. So it needs a process of application of power to it called phantom power. Uh, have anybody ever heard of that term? How many of you have heard of the term phantom power? Yeah, so most of you, good. So phantom power is critically important. And in, in the professional world, it's 48 volts of DC power that's run up through the mic cable into the microphone to power the electronics that are inside the mic. You can probably already guess why 
that's necessary. But I would like to ask if somebody would like to take a stab at explaining to me why that might be necessary. This is your moment. Unmute your mic and go for it. Anybody. Don't be bashful. Is everybody hearing the same thing I'm hearing? Sounds like we're being invaded by robot armies. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. Okay, can we take one more stab if somebody else would like to try to answer why power coming to this microphone might be very important? Namir, if you want to type your response into the chat, I can read it out over my mic. So we'll wait for that, but, but I, I want to show you something very interesting about this microphone that we, we haven't talked about yet. But I want to demonstrate it instead of talking about it. I tried to demonstrate it while I was going to hear the response, but uh, I'll just demonstrate it now. Now, remember, this lab is not on now. So what happens when I walk over here? What's happening to me? Any ideas? Why don't you hear me so well? Could it have to do with the fact that the microphone is back here? <laughs> It's a silly comment, but it is absolutely everything to do with the fact that the microphone is back here. Okay, so that brings me to what a microphone actually does. So a microphone listens to a particular amount of space near it. This particular microphone is called a cardioid microphone. It sees a pattern that looks kind of like this. Kind of like a, a, a ball coming out in all directions of course like that but it doesn't hear much back here okay it's made to hear sound on this side of the diaphragm not on that side everybody follow me so far so let's let's demonstrate that to make sure that we're all on the same page about what this is doing so if I start talking and I'm going to maintain the exact same distance from the microphone as I move over here and then I move over here, and then I move over here, and then I move back, trying to maintain the same distance, same distance, same distance. Tell me what just happened. Anybody, you can do it. Uh, the sound got quieter as you moved around and, yeah. and and pretty much disappeared as you got to the to behind the microphone. Probably close to disappearing, maybe not yeah. completely, but yeah. it's a fairly small space, but you're right. So one could say this microphone is quite directional. You, you're following me, my terminology? Yeah. So this is a cardioid style microphone. It has great applications where you might have feedback issues or where you don't want to hear an instrument that's right there or right there. You only want to hear an instrument that's right here. So understanding cardioids functionality is critically important. So let's take a quick pause. Uh, professor, it, did we get a did we get a typed response? We did not get a typed response. Okay, all right. Very good. I just didn't want to yeah, yeah. Didn't want to I didn't want to pass up a, a possibility of hearing that answer. Uh, the Space Invader answer, that is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I really liked it, by the way. Yeah. So interestingly enough, the, this cardioid pattern is a very common and very effective kind of microphone pattern that we need often in the recording process uh, because it helps, like I said, if there's a player here and a player here, this microphone's not going to hear those players so much. And if there's one back there, it's really not going to hear it. Now, here's where things get interesting. Uh, well, I'm going to call it interesting. Uh, you you will be the judge of whether it's really interesting. Give me a second. Okay, now I'm back on the lab for a minute because I want to make a quick change here. And this change involves taking this microphone and unplugging it. 
and setting it aside and going back to the other one that I told you looked just like it, except that this capsule is very, very different. But I'm not going to tell you how yet. I'm going to show you and you're going to tell me how. So I again, I plug it in. I've got to give it phantom power because it likes phantom power. It needs phantom power to work. I'm going to turn this up and I'm going to do the same exact test I did a minute ago. I'm going to say I'm going to maintain the best of my ability, the same distance from the microphone as I move around the microphone and I move around and I move around and I move around and I come back to the front and I come back to the front. Now, tell me what was different about the way this microphone heard me versus the other microphone. You couldn't hear a difference in sound. Like it seemed like it was consistent the whole way around. That's magic. That's like magic. I mean, it really is like magic. This microphone, even though it looks physically almost exactly like this microphone, same body, different capsule. This is an omnidirectional microphone. It's made to hear a circle all the way around the mic. All right. And it does an absolutely remarkable job of that to the extent that they're incredibly usable, functional and fabulous sounding microphones, but very dangerous. Remember my comment about the player who's here and here? Guess what? This microphone is fine with them being right here. It'll hear them just fine. And it'll hear this player that's right here just fine. Okay, so there's applications where this can be utilized because it's beautiful and natural sounding. But there's plenty of dangerous points of use with the omnidirectional microphone. So as we talk about the differences of cardioid and omnidirectional, bear that in mind. Uh, and then there's even a third kind of microphone that's incredibly narrow view. And that's called a hypercardioid, like ultracardioid. And it sees a very, very narrow envelope of sound in the front of it. I'll give you a quick demonstration. So this microphone sounds sonically considerably different than the other one. Would you not agree? If you remember, I said this was a dynamic microphone. Sorry about that. Told my camera to sit still. So the dynamic microphone has certain advantages, but also has some disadvantages. And one of the disadvantages is it's not as pristine and accurate, which can be an asset. Okay? Just because something isn't perfect doesn't mean it's not the best app in, in a certain application. That being said, I'm just going to pick this drum up real quick. All the sonic toys that I'm going to use for demonstrating today, I'm trying to pick things that you've probably not heard a lot. This is a dumbbell. It's a Middle Eastern instrument. All right. So if I quite a bit of difference. So one person at a time, 
tell me what you heard as the differences between these two microphones. I would say that the omnidirectional microphone has some more fuller sound compared to the dynamic. Good. Next. The uh, cardio um, mic uh, had a much more dis uh, distinct focused sound. The Picked hypercardio. Like a the hyper hypercardio, yes. Absolutely. It's like, it's like laser accurate. It's like right there, right? Correct. Very good. That's a great comment. Next. I'm looking for two more things. It, those are two of the four things I'm looking for right there. Come on, you can do it. The, uh, our, the omnidirectional microphone is able to pick up more reverberation. Yeah, the room, right? Because I'm not adding reverb. We'll get to that. But I'm not adding reverb. So it's my space. It's my stairwell, which I use as a reverb chamber. It's the fact that the room is 24 feet long on that side. I use that this microphone can hear that, right? You follow me? This microphone cannot. Even if I put it out in the middle of that room, it wouldn't hear it. So I can imagine both of those being the perfect microphone in a certain application. You following me? Mm -hmm. If I need clarity and I don't want to hear the instruments on either side of me, this is a great candidate. Inexpensive, great sounding microphone. If I need the best detail I can get with as much of the ambient quality of the room as is possible, hands down winner. So condenser, hands down winner for accuracy and, and room sounds. Now, keep in mind what you just heard because we're going to do another quick test here. Uh, and this test is going to involve going back to the earlier version of this microphone, which if you remember right, this is a condenser. But this condenser microphone, which is, looks just exactly like this one, there was clearly something different about the way it sounded than the way that sounds. But just so you have a chance to hear those side by each, let's do a direct comparison. So now remember, same microphone, this one, same microphone but set up as a cardioid. I'm waiting for my live to go off. Just a different capsule, same microphone, same drum, same experience. We're gonna start. Whoops. Get my live off. We're gonna start with this mic. Okay, same question. Tell me what you heard as the differences. I'm looking for three specific things. Don't be bashful. The cartoid there has a better dynamic range. It sounds like a better frequency capture. This, this mic? That's what I thought. Absolutely, it's got a much fuller spectrum of, of, of capabilities. Very good. That's one of the things I'm looking for. Second, next, who's next? Mike, if you see it in the chat, just chime in, please. Sure thing. Come on, you can do it. You can do it. Uh, the, the, sorry, I don't want to keep answering, but I'll answer. The other mic, uh, the hyper, one is uh, I found it to be a drier sound, almost. Uh, uh, it, it just it didn't didn't carry the full full sound of the drum. Okay, that's a fair that's a fair thing. I'm going to interpret that slightly. 
you hmm. don't hear much room. No, not at all. No, right? no, no. Even no, with no. even no. with this capsule, you still hear more room. Yes. Okay. Yes. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I, I'm not saying. Um, I'm just saying that's what we're hearing. Okay. And there's one third thing. It so we got a student with... chiming in that for the Omni one, we heard all the dynamics compared to the hypercardioid one, where you still heard dynamics, but they weren't as clear or vibrant. Right. How about how about this last with the cardioid condenser? versus the hypercardioid. The one more thing I'm looking for, I was demonstrating at the very end. I'll demonstrate it again. Hear the clarity of that? You'll never get that out of this, watch. The sound is there, but it's not the same detail. Uh. So the condenser microphone, because of the active circuitry in it, the electronics, which are actually making the thing super sensitive to vibration, is simply capable of picking up much greater detail than a dynamic. Just remember what I said. If you had players on either side of these two microphones, though, I might. <laughs> because it's going to have a very clear picture. of the instrument in the middle. Uh, so th then again, this again is part of the understanding of how sounds work with various microphones. Uh recording in progress <laughs> she's talking to me she's telling me things i like it you're hearing tell things more, yeah tell me more <laughs> divine intervention has occurred <laughs> well you got that ai already controlling yeah, yeah, your video no, camera I, you, know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know by the way if any time you want to clap just feel free you know it's okay it's good you know <laughs> so here's another thing i want to point out i didn't completely see that raise of hands, but I hope that most of you know what tone is. Yeah? At least what the word tone is. Uh, or timbre. In the music world, we like to call it timbre. Uh, in the audio world, they call it tone. Uh, in the more specific world, we call it EQ or equalization. And that is how frequencies occur across the spectrum of low frequencies to high. And I just want to point out something kind of interesting that microphones are not given enough credit for. So this is a this is a chromatic harmonica. Uh, I'm sure most of you know what a harmonica is, and you might even know what a chromatic harmonica is. But I just want to show you some interesting things about this microphone, which is a condenser microphone. And which capsule do we have on still? Cardioid. Cardioid. Okay. Which we can remind ourselves what that means by me doing this. <laughs> Okay, we can remind ourselves that the backside is different. I'm not gonna say it's bad, it's different. Because this side, which is called off axis, becomes like timbre. It becomes like a tone control. So if this Very different sounds. And I'm not going on around to the behind of the side of the mic. I'm just going to the sides. So there was a lot of questions I read from some of you about recording brass instruments. I just showed you the, the most important trick you need to understand for brass. Where is the sound that you want to hear? <laughs> and I can't answer that for every instrument. I've actually recorded two trumpets played by two different players same brand of trumpet, same model of trumpet, 
and the sound coming out of the bell was completely different. Okay? I'm not a trumpet player, but I have to assume that has to do with embouchure and accuracy of how they deal with their embouchure. I have to assume that. Okay? So what we find is all of a sudden the position of the mic, I mean, perfectly acceptable to record straight into a microphone. That's how they're designed to work. But maybe that's not quite the sound you want. So sides are also fine. And I'll tell you where that's really important. Here. If your recording device is this, you need to be very carefully experimenting with the way this microphone relates to the source that you're recording. It can make a huge difference in the outcome of a recording done on a phone. Enormous, almost more than this. <laughs> because it, it's, it's such a small and tiniest little small place that every little subtle thing you do with that changes the sound dramatically. So understanding proximity to the microphone is critically important. And I have another way I wanna demonstrate proximity. Everybody knows that proximity means the distance from something, right? Well, let me just say that proximity also has to do with frequency response when it comes to a microphone. I'm going to demonstrate that with my incredibly competent little demonstration tool here, which I'll talk about in a minute. So not only does the sound change and the quantity of sound change, the timbre changes dramatically. And at the end there, I was cheating. I was following with volume the distance change I was doing to try to keep the sound level very close to the same, but the timbre was shifting dramatically. Nowhere on the planet is that more understandable than with the human voice proximity effect can make you sound much bigger than you are. And with a mic like this, it's really examining proximity effect versus non-proximity effect versus off-axis versus normal versus proximity effect. All of that tone, if you will, is relative to the position of the microphone to the source. Experimentation is the driving force, without a doubt. Experimentation is the driving force of finding how to record any given sound. Whatever you own is an adequate tool. Whatever you're capturing is an adequate inspiration for recording. The question is, how do you start acquiring it? How do you start grasping all of the things necessary to bring all this information into play and make sure your gain's right and all that, which we're going to talk about after the break. But suffice to say, <laughs> the, the, the idea is microphones have very specific ways that they pick up sound. And they're all different quite different. 
the pre so Ray, actually I've got a couple questions from the students at some point great that my, right now go awesome okay so first burning question what is that tool called that you use to do the proximity effect <laughs> <laughs> okay I, I'll grab it <laughs> and can you get that in a package with your crazy video camera <laughs> yeah yeah you can't yeah, there. now this this I'm a I'm an avid fan of circuit bending which is a a fad that started in Great Britain a number of years ago and has expanded into the United States and Canada. And I own about 60 instruments that are basically children's toys like this one is, that then you'll notice a bunch of switches. Uh, internally, there's about 30 feet of wire reconnecting various parts of the soundboard inside this to uh, various, I have a small printed circuit board inside that has a timing chip, it has a pitch modulation chip, and it has a decay chip. So with these switches, I can make it do things it was never designed to do. And <laughs> thus is the world of circuit bending. Uh, early yeah. amplifiers in Great Britain were made by circuit benders, guitar amps, electric guitar amps, because nobody was making them yet. Fender didn't exist. So this tradition has been around a long time, and I'm, I'm a big fan of it. I do a lot of film score work with these toys um, because they're so bizarre. I mean, uh -huh. you, heard, you heard the grandpa. That's the thing it's designed to do. All the rest of the sounds you heard me do with this were uh, as a result of the circuit bending that I did internally. I mean, someday I, I should take some pictures inside one of these where I can show people <laughs> what's gone on. Because there's just wires connecting various parts of my new circuit with the circuit that's in there. And, and about 20% wow. of the time when you build one of these, you destroy it before you finish. <laughs> you put too much voltage across some circuit and you end up basically killing the circuit. So that's part of the fun. There's also wow. a chance of losing, you know, yeah. like losing the battle. Cool. Well, let the record reflect one of our students identified that as a circuit bending uh, technique. I uh, had another simpler question about the kind of microphone in the phone. Is that a cardio capsule mic? There, in there? Those are typically electric condensers. They are they are powered mics. They have a power supply that's drawn off of the battery of the, of the internally, which is why they have such great high frequency response. Uh, and they sound so uh, good in comparison to what you might think would come out of a phone recording. Okay. So they are typically electric condenser microphones. Some even record in stereo, some phones. Uh, okay. some in mono. Uh, and there are interfaces you can purchase for phones and iPads that allow for higher quality microphones to be plugged into the device too. Huh. Just as a point of reference. Okay. Any other uh, burning another, questions? Yeah, another question about phantom power and does it make the microphone more sensitive and able to pick up sound from a farther distance? Well, I, I would ask you to compare what you heard in the phantom powered microphones to the condenser. I mean, to the to the dynamic. And you you tell me, what do you think? I, I, I shake your head one way or another. <laughs> I think, yes, that's absolutely what happens. The phantom power provides a, a circuit to be engaged, which gives a, a far greater amount of dynamic range and a far greater amount of detail to the pickup okay. of the microphone. Now, here's the weird part, though. The sound was already there. It just was too quiet. Right. So the phantom power provides deeper amplification prior to the preamp. That gets it to, into this category of much more definition and much more precision and much more uh, accuracy, if you will. Excellent. OK. Well, we've got a couple uh, more questions, but I know we should also take a break at some yeah, point. Yeah, so here's what we're going to do. I've got about a two minute speed round here. This is a very quick look at some of the questions you posed to me in your Google Doc. Uh, the question was, what specific issues would you find most valuable to have demonstrated? Listen carefully, your, your question may come up. Changing the distance from the mic to the sound source really generates different sound effects. Absolutely. How to make poorly recorded sound sound better. Re-record <laughs> it. <laughs> Time lag and bad quality of recordings. I think they mean latency. I'm going to talk about latency in the next half. Uh, if that's not what they mean, I'll try to get a clarification. Mic positioning for a drum kit. That's a week long answer. It takes a week to answer that. The simple reality is how many mics do you have? If you have one, it's got to be up in the front where all instruments are capable of being recorded. If you've got two, it's probably going to be on the kick drum 
and up high over the middle. If you've got three, it's probably going to be kick and snare and one overhead. If you've got four, you get it. The more mics you have, the more ample ways you can assess a drum set sound. Simple but effective post recording and production things we can do. Learn how equalizers work, period. It's the most important thing. Learn that the basic frequencies you need to understand are from about 300 cycles to 2.5K. That's it. All the rest is icing. Very, very, very subtle icing. Mixing audio and syncing parts. I think they mean to film. Uh, the, the simplest way is use a, you know, a program like DaVinci Resolve, which will sync it for you. Um, if that's not the question, be more specific. Recording pipe organ, omnidirectional mics. <laughs> Omni-directional mics. That's how to record pipe organ. What EQ settings should I use to provide more clarity in the instrument? Always mid and high frequencies for clarity. How do I master a track? Complicated question, also about a one-week answer. But most generally, put it through a, a peak limiter, bring the basic low side of the volume up, call it a day. Uh, how do I record to multiple tempos in the same song? That's a great question. The simple answer is in software, you can't. The, comp the more realistic answer is you record, pre-record click tracks at the tempos you want and perform to those click tracks. Don't depend on the software to do the, comp the heavy lifting if you're gonna have more than one tempo. Remote recording, syncing tracks, syncing video and audio, DaVinci Resolve or Final Cut Pro. Mixing, uh, that's a three week course. Uh, we, we can talk about it a little bit in the next half we do. How to properly mix multiple tracks and how to layer tracks to sound fuller. Start with low levels. Don't get in a hurry to get loud. That's the biggest trick. Understand where you want pieces to be placed left to right, front to back on the stage. Mix accordingly. Uh, tips to make recordings sound natural. Use great mics uh, <laughs> and great preamps and have good sources in a nice space. If all those things are right, you're good. Everything will sound great. Finding the right spot to set the mics for the instrument. I've already alluded to that. Use your ears. How to get the best sound quality in my, uh, for brass instruments. I alluded to that. Realize where the sound is coming from before you even begin to go out of it. Appropriate gain levels. Minus 10 is good. Minus 10 is good. Minus 10 is good. Minus 10 is good. You don't have to be louder than minus 10. Volume. Yeah, it should be. Volume is important. Mastering. Remember, that's a two-week three-week course. How to avoid peaking, especially when layering sounds. Proper compression, how to use a limiter. That's a two and a half week course, but the, the general sense of it is start with volumes low. Peak limiting and compression don't have to be used quite as much if you just start with everything low and bring it up slowly. You have control of the mix from the very beginning then. Recommended video camera for better video quality, the most expensive one you can afford. That's, the, that's really simple. Ideal microphone settings placement experiment. How do I adjust my mic and interface to get the best quality? Experiment and understand noise, <laughs> noise floor, which we're gonna talk about. How to improve sound quality? Start with a good player, start with a good instrument, and you're already halfway home if not further, okay? Uh, how do you best troubleshoot when you have background static? Start from the source. Start at the very beginning with the mic. Unplug the mic if it's still there, it's not the mic. Plug the mic back in. Just keep going down the line. Start from the very beginning of the chain though. Always troubleshoot in a specific order, either front to back or back to front. Uh, how does the Behringer 802 USB fit into recording? A complete neophyte. It, it, it can be your entire interface and it can do a pretty good job at it. Okay, that's the simple answer. Thanks, that's the end of the speed round. We're now gonna take a 10 minute break. You'll get another speed round at the end. With the second set of questions, there's far less of them, uh, but they're even shorter answers, some of them. <laughs> All right. Well, will the answers be provided in the form of a question? <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. There's so much information there. Let's all take a 10 minute break away from the screen. Give your eyeballs a rest and I'll see you back here then. Great. I wasn't sure. That's cool. That space, that moving around the microphone, it made that so clear that, oh. Uh, yeah. Huh. Cool. Are you ready to start again? I'm in. I'm gone. <laughs> okay. All right.
Welcome back, everyone. As you can see, Ray has an amazing demonstration queued up for us here. So uh, just a reminder, drop your questions into the chat and I'll group them up and we'll check in on them at some point. There's two documents in the chat window now with some notes uh, for the second part of this. So he'll call out when he's into each section. So I encourage you to download those and you can download those and you can take your notes in there right now. All right, enjoy. Greetings and welcome back. So we just covered about eight topics. Uh, I'll try to run through that really quick. Never push any part of the audio chain any further than it can handle. Even a microphone of this quality can distort. I just proved that. Don't overplay a microphone. Never record very low levels. Did you notice what the last thing I did was? What was the last thing I did over here? Anybody figure that out when I walked over here? I'll give you a hint. Can you see this? That's a humidifier. That's about 40% of what you heard through everything I just did. Noise is our enemy. Poor gain structure is our enemy. So identify noises, maximize your gain efficiencies, get as much signal as is needed into the microphone and no more. Watch levels, I can watch meters and see levels. Listen for distortion. Just in case you get too close. And more important than everything, Look at the results if you have a waveform being put up on a screen in front of you. So all of these things couple together to create a better outcome at the end of the day. Uh, noise is just something that's not intended. Okay, it, it could be anything. In this case, it was a humidifier. It could be a bad preamplifier. It could be a bad microphone. It could be an air handler. In a certain rooms, air handlers are really, really, really noisy. It could be somebody, you know, doing something while you're trying to record. Noise can be any kind of thing. So identify noises as soon as you hear them. And if they're inappropriate and you don't want them, get rid of them. Whatever that means. Controlling your environment. 
controlling the source of the noise, which I left on through that entire demonstration. And, and never underestimate the problems that can arise if you over record. Even my simple little uh, noise maker that's called a ghost box. It's one of the coolest little noise makers you'll ever find. It's got six samples that just play loops over and over and over. You just pick between the six. Even that, when I put it too close to this incredible Neumann U87 microphone, distorted. Okay, so the simplest sound incorrectly positioned in a microphone can cause catastrophic results. So watch, listen, and look. Chase noise. Maintain the very best signal flow you can in your gain structure. Now, what that really means in terms of recording is understanding each step of the way where the volume settings should be placed. And that's not easy to do all the time. Uh, as a matter of fact, I would say it's very difficult to do sometimes. But by and large, maintaining control of gain is about watching level meters, understanding sound source. If I've got a trumpet and I'm playing really loud, I shouldn't probably be two inches from this microphone. All right, it's really that simple. If I've got an instrument that's incredibly quiet, then I can get quiet and I can get close. But if the instrument's too loud for the setting, make sure you're positioning yourself and the instruments, the sound source and the microphone appropriately. There's no rule. Just listen. Watch levels, look at meters, and listen. And all three of those tools are important because sometimes the levels look okay, but something in the chain is distorting nonetheless. Even though the record level looks fine, something is recording, something is being overdriven. So the best part of understanding noise and distortion is trying to figure out where it comes from. And the other, the other good part about it is the best way to learn how to defeat it is to deal with it. <laughs> you know, there's, there's no golden rule. Like if you do this and this and this, you won't have noise problems. It's not how it works. You need to learn how to confront noise, find it, and fix it. All right? It's, it's not rocket science. Remember I said from the very beginning, the most important tool you have are your two ears. So if you're sitting in headphones listening to something you're recording or the, something that you just recorded and you hear a sound that you don't think came from the player, you've got to figure out where it came from and what you can do to fix it. You know, and, and another thing I wanted to point out, this is an interesting instrument to melodica, but I play it this way. And there's something interesting about a melodica. A, a melodica... makes noise, all right? Makes lots of noise. Air, clickety-clackety, and the reed. The question is, which of those three, or maybe all of those three, do you want on your print? Do you want air? clicky clackety or do you just want the instrument reed sounding as clean and pure as it possibly can so i'll give you a little trick lav is off now we're just hearing this microphone i'll verify that for your ears right so watch this Just moving slightly off axis, the key clicks become very, very, very soft. Signal to noise ratio. People always ask me, what does that mean? It means exactly what it says. Signal 
noise. Signal to noise ratio. Now, the last thing I wrote on my sheet, my little cheat sheet there for part two is noise is not always bad. <laughs> you know, if you take the chiff of a pipe organ sound away from a pipe organ sound, it no longer sounds like a pipe organ. If you have a guitar and you're recording a guitar, let's just say uh, a six string guitar. And let's just say it's got a kind of a, by the way, this is a very altered tuning. If any of you are into tunings, this is not going to sound normal to you. Now, if you recorded that like this, Better like the sound of a fan a lot and not really care too much about the sound of the guitar because my signal to noise ratio in my ears is not very pleasing because I'm not a big fan of the fan if you know what I mean. So at the end of the day, the point remains, signal to noise is, is controllable, I promise. Um, if the noise ends up being electronic, more often than not, it's an inferior uh, interface or microphone preamp in the interface, okay? The easiest way to upgrade your interface, if you already own an audio interface and it's working 90% of the time, just like you expect, and 10% of the time, it doesn't sound quite as good as you wished it did, I will pretty much guarantee you if you updated your microphone preamp and possibly and or possibly your microphone, it might be just exactly what you need without changing the interface at all. Because the preamp is critical. It's really, really critical. So signal to noise, totally manageable, but you have to understand what it is. And I hope that that gives you a little bit more of a kind of a picture <laughs> if you for lack of a better term, of what signal to noise is. Okay. Great. Actually, Ray got a couple of questions from the sure. students about some noise things. So uh, questions about the usefulness of the wind guards and the foam covers on the microphones for taking care of different kinds of noise. Absolutely imperative for pop, pop filters, pop, pop, peas, plosives. Uh, if this were, if you can't see it, but I have my vocal mic chain is set up over there, which are two tube mics on top of one another. Um, and they have a, a plosive filter in front of them, a pop filter in front of them. Because singers are notorious for hitting P's too hard and uh, causing those big spikes in the waveform. So I use them all the time. I think they're great. Uh, I even have a foam cover for this. I just don't, it, it's too much sonic change for me. So I, I like the the, the uh, little circular ones in the front, much, much better. They're much better for handling that. Now, outdoors, wind noise, sometimes you have to have a sock on it. You know, you have to have a foam screen on the top of the microphone 
to, man to manage uh, wind noise, because wind noise is a whole other problem. It can completely overtake the audio so that there's nothing from the audio source making it in if the wind noise is strong enough, because the whole diaphragm is just relating only to the wind. So you have to be aware that you know that 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 can be that that can be a game ender. You know if, yeah. if if you if you have too much wind, it's like game over. You, you mm. can't do anything about it really. So that's a good question. Further okay. question? Yeah. So another question, slightly different topic, but I'm sure, sure it's something that a lot of students are dealing with right now. Uh, someone's wondering about the best setup for recording a bass trombone because the big problem I'm seeing from a couple of people is how do you record a big sound? in a small right. room? Uh, well, first off, there is a limit. Uh, low frequency waveforms take, they have to form a full waveform before they mature into a sonically into the proper physics wave of the sound being made. If that's being cut short for part of the, tr the range of an instrument because the room is too short or too small, uh, you've got a whole other problem and it's, you just can't. I mean, you're basically, you have an instrument not working properly based on its laws of physics. If the low frequencies can't completely form a waveform, a whole entire up, down, and back to the median line, then, then that frequency can't be made in that room. And it makes it impossible to get a balanced sound on the bass trombone if the room is that tiny. Um, I mean, I know that's probably not the answer you want to hear, but that's unfortunately the reality of it. It's like that marimba you see uh, there in the professor's uh, room needs uh, about 16, minimum of 16 feet to get the first partial of the low C. And it really needs 32 feet of length to get the lowest, the, the, the uh, fundamental of that lowest frequency. And you know, all of you technical guys, you understand this, that waveforms uh, have to have air and space to, to mature and believe it or not, even though we're only this far away with a microphone or some distance away, the waveform still has to form somewhere or, or the sound isn't going to be made. So there's a lot of problems inherent to recording bass trombone in a small space that, that can't be you know, addressed really, unfortunately, except by moving to a bigger space. Another? Uh, uh... Yeah, so there's some questions about recording indoors versus outdoors. Like, is there a different microphone recommendation for that outdoor recording setup? Yeah, uh, ones that you don't mind getting damaged. <laughs> the, the chances of damaging a microphone are far greater outdoors. So you won't see my U87s outside or my 47 or my 251 or any of my other high-end microphones. I just don't trust the, the environment. Plus the humidity spikes up and down are not good for microphones either. You'll find mm. lots of dynamics being used uh, in, in outdoor recording because they work so well. Uh, and they can, you can put a pop filter on and it'll reject a lot of wind noise. So if you're forced to record outdoors, you need to have uh, lesser quality mics. <laughs> I hate to mm. say that, but that's, that's the reality. You, you don't need expensive mics to record outdoors. Would that Zoom hand, uh, handheld recorder work well for outdoors? Yeah, I've actually got a big windsock for this. Yeah, I use it outdoors a lot, but I put the big windsock on it. I mean, if it's windy. It works great outdoors, though, even if it's if it's not windy, it's fantastic. It works really, really well outdoors. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a good question. Okay, great. And then one, one more. more. I don't, yeah. yeah, yeah. Just about general questions about recording in stereo versus mono. I mean, ah. obviously stereo is going to be better, but what are the trade-offs for students, you know, facing small rooms and these kinds of complicated questions? Um, is, is, uh, the bonus page is not in the chat yet. Is that correct? The, is the, that, my, the, uh, three and four are in the chat. Yeah. There's another page coming that, that kind of is my final Testament. <laughs> It'll come at the end. And, and basically it, I'm just going to read something to you. It says, uh, uh, where, where is the line I'm looking for? Oh, I, I don't, don't think I don't you see got a bonus I, page. I yeah, it's, a, it's at the end of my document. You, it may be in this. It may be the second page of this. Is the page with my email address visible anywhere at the very bottom? That'd be a question uh, hold for on. Ben. We're going to have to check. Yeah, <laughs> we'll get back to you on that. Okay. Anyway, the, the question about stereo is, uh, 
it brings with it great dangers. <laughs> uh, and the biggest one is phase cancellation. Um, if you've got a whole big group of people and you've got two microphones evenly spaced in an XY pattern or in spaced omnis, you're safe. But everything else with two microphones, you have the possibility of creating phase cancellation just by showing up. <laughs> so it, stereo recording is trickier than a lot of people imagine. Uh, there is a reference at the end. If you must record in stereo, two microphones or more for one or more sources, please read up on phase here. There's a whole link I set in, my, in the last page of my document that'll give you a lot of information about recording in stereo because it's, it is tricky. Uh, you can get yourself in big trouble. If you have phase cancellation problems, all your bass voices will come and go and come and go and come and go and come and go because they're going in and out of phase and in and out of phase and in and out of phase. Hmm. So, we have On the document, we have some final thoughts. There's not an email address on there. Yeah, at the very bottom, Ray Dillard at nexuspercussion.com should be on that document. I'm looking at the last page. Okay. It starts, uh, we'll with, it starts with synopsis, final thoughts, headphones, microphones another issue and appendix. Okay. Uh, we'll, and then it says we'll have fun. And then it says have fun. And then it has my email address. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Look into that. And, and if you don't have it, I can resubmit that to you. Sure. We'll figure it out. Yeah. So yeah, stereo is dangerous. It, it's nice. Certainly everything ends up in stereo, but it's nice. Uh, if you can start with multiple mono sources and then mix to stereo, you'll always have better outcomes. You know, multiple mono sources are are the rule. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna close in in a short order with I'm gonna sit back down if you don't mind, and I just want to quickly go through a little bit of part four. Um, I realize some parts of part three are impractical. Okay, I realize that, like you don't have multiple microphones sometimes, but I certainly if I'm if you have multiple microphones try several for any given application. You might be surprised which one actually ends up working the best. Um, that, that's up in part three. Uh, and, and the last rule is of course, assume nothing. Just just experiment. The best, best way of finding your way forward in recording audio is by experimentation, period. In part four, I just gave you a kind of a very short synopsis of my approach to mixing and mastering. Uh, I'm not going to read to you. I figure you're pretty good at reading. So I'm just going to leave that with you to assess uh, on your own terms and on your own time. Simple, simply put for me, and I am a, I'm a mix. I love mixing. It's my absolute very favorite part of the recording process is mixing because that's when I get to play in the band. You know, I'm like the last player. I get to make all the final decisions of how something sounds in the mix. And I actually really love that. It's my favorite part. I like tracking. I kind of grown to hate editing. I've recorded, I've played on about 2,200 records in my life. Uh, that's my last count. I've produced just under 500 records uh, in my life. Uh, and I've grown to the point where editing is, is not my favorite thing to do. Uh, I've just done so much editing and uh, um, I like tracking. I like the energy of tracking. I like inspiring people to play great, but I'm not a big fan of editing anymore, <laughs> but I love mixing. So if anybody's looking for a job as an editor, uh, give me a call. <laughs> mm. But anyway, in the mixing notes there, it's just a matter of understanding what you're trying to go for. What, what are you trying to capture and what do you want it to sound like at the end? And like I said earlier on, start with low levels. Build your volume up over time in a mix. Don't start with everything up at zero on the VU meter and start with everything down in level and slowly build your volume up and you'll get a better outcome, I guarantee you. Um, mastering is, is a black art. It's a mystery, it's a black art. And uh, I'll be very honest with you. I have personally mastered, oh, maybe a dozen to 24 records somewhere. I don't know the exact number, more than a dozen, but less than 24. Uh, but they were records I had absolutely nothing to do with until they were sent to me to master. And that's the only way I can do that, that work. Because what mastering is all about is optimizing a recording that's been made in usually two or three or four or five or six different environments with different players, different mics, different preamps, different days, different energies, and trying to make it sound like a record. That is what mastering is. 
it's not just making something loud. <laughs> That's the common <laughs> modern misunderstanding of what mastering it. Oh, we just make it loud. Well, you just turn the peak limiter on, crank the input going into the peak limiter, make sure it doesn't sound like dog poop. And you've just mastered it. Well, that's that's not mastering. You know, mastering is is a fine art. And the engineers that I have used over my lifetime total three. For every record I've ever produced, I've only had three mastering engineers. Two of the three are now retired. And that's the only reason I only have one now. You establish a relationship as an engineer, I do, with with a mastering engineer. And they understand you and you understand them. And, and like I say, it's a, it's a mysterious art form. Uh, they hear things I don't even understand. I've been called into mastering sessions where the engineer is ecstatic. He says, you got to check this out. This is where we were. And this is where we are now. Isn't that amazing? And I go, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't even know what you did. I don't hear anything different. So, Suffice to say, I think of it as a, as a very, very high art and it's incredibly important, but it's becoming almost unheard of that people master records anymore. And most important thing, and I explain it here, is to you master towards where you're going with the project. Is it going to be streamed only? Is it going to be downloaded? Is it going to be a CD? Is it going to be part of a film? What's its final landing point? Is it going to be on the radio? Then it's got to really be compressed and peak limited. So it's about where you're going with the project. That's what mastering engineers face. And often when I send a project off, it gets mastered three different ways. It gets mastered one way for MP3 and other small, what I call small formats. It gets mastered another way for 44.1 sample rate at 16 bit, that's for compact discs. And it gets mastered a third way at the highest possible audio quality based on the recording itself. I typically record at 24 bit, 96 kilohertz uh, sample rate, which is two and a half times the quality of a CD. So suffice to say, sample rate is everything in terms of accuracy of recording. Uh, but if you're making CDs and you record it at 2496, it's still going to get dumbed down, as we call it, to 44.1 <laughs> sample rate and 16 bit depth. So. That's a whole other study looking into bit, bit depth and sample rates. You can read a ton about it online. There's so many things you can get good information online. You can also get a lot of bad information, but I would inspire you to spend some time studying. You know, you want to learn about all the free software out there, just read reviews and then download it. As I said to, to Mike during the break, a uh, piece of software, you should just try it out. If, if you don't like it, don't use it. You know, you can try out software nowadays. So try it out. If it works for you, great. If you don't like the way it feels or looks, uh, try something else. You know, there's a lot of options. There's at least a half dozen great options for software. Um, time for one more quick question from the floor and then I've got speed round and then we'll take a full question and answer. <laughs> Okay, a lot of the questions would maybe take a week to answer, but we've got one that's probably pretty straightforward. If you have a condenser mic, do you need both a preamp and an interface or just one or the other? Both. Let's understand the roles. The preamplifier makes a microphone signal louder. The interface converts analog, dig, analog sound to digital data in order for it to be restored, uh, recorded and then later retrieved from the digital source. So the analog to digital converter that's taking place in the interface, the preamplifier is taking place in the preamp. Now, here's the reality. Most all interfaces have two preamps built in. Please understand that. They can provide phantom power to the microphone. They can provide preamplification for the microphone and they provide the digital interface for the computer. Almost all interfaces do that. If you remember in the first stage, I said one of the best ways to improve your interface is to buy really great preamps instead of using the ones built in. You know, there's a reason I have racks full of great preamps because <laughs> they're, they're superior to the interface preamps quite often. That's a great question though. That's a great question. I hope that gives you some clarity of the, of the differences there. Okay, very quick. And then we full floor. Do you have any other specific questions, topics you would like addressed? Will depend on time. 
I am also interested in learning the best mic we can buy from Amazon with reasonable price. Order them, try them. If you hate them, return them. Reducing noise while recording or in post. Always reduce noise at source. Always reduce noise at source. We don't fix everything in post. The, the toolbox I use for fixing noises is made by Isotope. It's called RX. It's $2,700 for the base package. Is that what you want to use? Great. Go for it. It's not necessary. Just get rid of the noises before you print them. That's the deal. What do people do to recordings to make them sound better after recording the raw sound? Careful mixing and mastering. Careful mixing and mastering. Mixing orchestral instruments, brass specifically, especially, and any specific pointers you may have when recording and mixing them. Listen to great orchestras and great concert halls. Emulate that. If you've never heard an orchestra in a hall, go to a TSO concert. Period. You, you can't mix classical music if you haven't heard it in great rooms. Because then you don't, know, you don't know what to shoot for. You know. So that's the best recommendation there. Any recording recommendations? Uh, example, external microphone recommended for students, condenser, others, similar recommendations for basic recording. Uh, the, the one single thing I will say is the AKG Lyra is a very powerful all-in-one unit. It's one mic. It's got a USB plug. It's your interface. It's your headphone system. You have zero latency because you're monitoring right at the source. You're not monitoring through your computer. If you don't understand why latency occurs, it's because the sound has to go into your computer, get processed, get digitized, get stored, get reread, get replayed back through the digital to analog converter, put into an amplifier and sent to your headphones. That takes time. That's what latency is. It's the time for the information to get into the computer circuit, printed, reread, and back out. If your headphones are plugged into your interface, you're listening to the sound exactly when it comes in. There's no latency. That's the solution. Are there any free ways to get rid of background noise in recordings? Yes, there are some plugins that are free that do a decent job. Uh, do the research. There's tons of examples. Um, talk about the inputs and outputs as well as set of mics, interfaces, and instruments. That would be really awesome. Uh, my, my statement's always the same. First question is, what's your budget? Uh, your professor that's on screen with us right now had a very <laughs> specific setup he was interested in doing. What's the first question I ask you? Yeah, how much are you willing to spend? What's your budget? You know, you can buy a really great condenser microphone for a hundred bucks. That small tube microphone I showed you back there, about 7,000 bucks. You can buy a really great large diaphragm condenser like back there uh, for a hundred bucks. That Neumann U87, that's a vintage first year it was released. I have a matched pair of consecutive serial numbers, probably on the open market, 12,000 bucks a pop. You don't need to spend that. There's so many great mics made now. You don't need to spend that kind of money. Uh, the last one was about Jamulus, and I have to be perfectly honest. That's the easiest one for me to answer. I have no idea. I, I don't know the software. I, I, I don't know. But the, I can tell you the AKG Lyra as an all-in-one unit. You can do omni recording. You can do cardioid. You can do tight cardioid. You can do stereo XY, all from within one mic housing. It looks kind of cool. It looks kind of like an old RCA ribbon mic but it's not. It's very modern. It's made by AKG. It's called the Lyra, L-Y-R-A. I think it's just over 200 bucks. It's an incredible value. If you have one thing and one thing only, that would be the thing, in my opinion. Okay, the floor is open. Bring them on. All right. Well, um, I'm happy to go through all the questions that we've got now. Uh, if you're okay to stick around for a bit, I can stick Sounds around for a bit. Me. I mean, the other thing is, I have, I have, uh, uh, Ben. Can you verify if your if your last page is correct? Uh, so I think the my... document we got didn't have your email address, but we dug it up and I can put it in the chat whenever. So you the want. bottom of the document should look like this. I mean, it's the same document I emailed. Yeah, I think we have we have have fun, and then literally the only thing we're missing is your email at the bottom. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know what? You must not have paid the fee. I usually ask for a certain fee to put my email address on there. You know, I guess, mm -hmm. I guess, uh, you know, the, the, 
the folks that contacted me from finance today, I guess they didn't pay it. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, once the check clears, we'll send the, <laughs> the email along. Yeah. No, it's rdillard at nexuspercussion.com. rdillard at nexuspercussion.com. Ben will drop that into the chat there. Uh, okay, cool. So, let's and see. So, the there. other thing that before we start opening questions up is I, I mentioned to, to the professor that I would be willing for two days to take additional questions via email. Uh, I have to put a time limit on it because I could be inundated. I did a, a, a clinic at Michigan like this, a Zoom clinic, and this afternoon at 4.30, I got a about my 700th email <laughs> from someone at Michigan. Uh, so I don't take this wrong, but I've learned my lesson. I, I have to kind of put a time limit on it. Uh, I, and I and I might not answer you immediately, but I will answer any questions you send me via email. So don't hesitate to ask. Fair enough. Okay, well, thanks. I'll just go shotgun style through all these questions here. Great. Uh, start off with a straightforward one. What does 96K mean? 96 kilohertz is a sample rate. It means that there are 96,000 pictures, uh, XY grid pictures taken of the waveform in a given second. It's a samples per second, 96,000 cycles per second. For most of you, if you don't know what that is, you don't know what 44.1 is or 48 is or any of those. That sample rate is how many little tiny digital pictures are taken every second of the audio. So for instance, for all of you that have heard the old adage that says digital recording isn't really recording, it's a correct statement. It's not really a recording. It's little tiny pictures. And they're so close together that when they're played back, our brain fills in the gaps. And if you don't understand that, go read about film and frame rates. If you don't understand that, because film is also not moving pictures. It's static pictures. Fast enough that our eyes coupled with our brain will fill in the gaps. It's exactly the same thing in digital audio. It's little tiny pictures of the audio. And it's taken on a grid that's basically a stair step. It's not on a smooth curve. So the most beautiful sine wave is not recorded like that. It's recorded like this. <laughs> it's just that they're so close together that we believe them and we hear them as smooth audio. Yes. That's what and for more information, is. enroll in Music 2MC3, where we go through all this in glorious detail. Uh, okay, so for a six-channel Zoom mic, does that mean you can record six people at the same time? Yes, if you have, uh, if you have four channels of preamps plugged in to either side, two on each side, and this, which you can, by the way, you can buy an adapter that goes here, and you can plug two more cables in here if you have six preamps. But this has one preamp built in, one stereo preamp. So yes, you can record six different channels at the same moment. This is one of the most incredible values in high quality audio I've ever seen in my entire life. You know, this and an AKG Lyra, I could, I could make tons of records with a computer, some free software, this and uh, an AKG Lyra. And my next purchase would be a four channel preamp, maybe like this one, if I can get over here. This is a four channel preamp, this is a four channel preamp. One of those, one of these, four good microphones plus the stereo pair, man, you're laughing. Hmm. It's amazing because I think like 40 years ago, the amount of gear you'd need to accomplish <laughs> what you could do for 15, 100 bucks, a thousand bucks now. Is my incredible. first four channel reel to reel tape recorder was made by Tascam. The tapes were, this is in the 70s, the tapes were $38 a piece. They recorded 11 minutes of music and it had four channels and it sounded like absolute It was terrible, <laughs> but it's all I could afford. You know what it cost me? $7,995 to sound that bad. For $7,995, I could put together a state-of-the-art recording setup for any one of you with great everythings. So times have changed. Yeah, I could sound bad for a lot less than that. 
Uh, okay, so question here about brass instruments in the in relation to the transients. So which brass instruments have the most high transients and how, uh, what should students know about recording them? Uh, probably in the brass family, the uh, high trumpet parts have the most transient energy. Um, but in general, in general, brass instruments don't have fast transients. They're medium, they're medium fast. Uh, everybody know what a glockenspiel is or a set of bells? That's a transient, okay? That's a transient. That sound is absolutely instantaneously mic crushing and preamp melting. You know, if you have a setup that can record glockenspiel, you can record anything because it's very difficult to record. It's like mm. the top end of that marimba behind you there uh, with a hard mallet, that's a transient. Brass instruments, mm. the lips have to start moving, things have to happen. Eventually the air has to get through the horn. Eventually the bell has to vibrate. And even at the most staccato uh, embouchure, that takes time in comparison to a glockenspiel hit with a brass mallet. <laughs> hmm. That's so instant, it's frightening. <laughs> Is that, that hurts I, before you hit it. <laughs> yeah, I find it much harder to record a vibraphone than a marimba. And I don't know, is there, is there, is that just because I set it up wrong or? Does uh, it make any sense? Most people have vibraphone miking too high uh, and you don't get a good balanced sound of the instrument and, and vibraphones are inherently noisy. Remember, mm. remember my <laughs> fan back here? Vibraphones make a lot of noise that is not part of the sound and it's just the nature of a rickety, bizarre instrument with a pedal that uh. Uh, the very best ones are noisy and the very worst ones are downright scary. <laughs> Huh. I've lost so, more time on percussion recordings trying to get vibraphones <laughs> clean in, in a studio than any other instrument. Interesting. So should a, speaking of that noise thing, should a saxophone player try to record off axis more than other instruments to avoid that key clacking? It, it, it's, two, it's two things about a saxophone. First of all, the sound doesn't come out of the bell. Uh, the sound comes out of the middle of the instrument. Second of all, there's air at the embouchure and some players love that and want that sound. Some players hate it and want to avoid it. And off axis can, can balance out, because the, the sound is kind of coming out of various parts of the horn throughout mm. their playing. So mm. a little bit of distance, that the whole three to one triangle rule, get a little bit of distance from the top to the bottom of the instrument, come out an isosceles triangle worth at least. And then I usually get over to the side a little bit, not way over, but a little off center. Uh, and mm. I also use ribbon microphones like the one on the stand back there because they're mm. so accurate. They're so mm. accurate. They work great with saxophones. Okay, great. Well, um, I don't want to keep you too long with questions. So maybe we'll just do one more and then some wrap up. Okay. Unless you want to stick around for longer, which is fine on this end. Well, I have, I have a little more time. Okay. There's something just popped up just now from Christian. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they're they're coming in. I've got a whole list over here too. Yeah. Uh, so I got a question about brass recording for trombone. Someone's using a Rode NT USB mic to record. Is that going to work out okay for the trombone? Yeah, as long as the space they're in is okay. I mean, ah. it becomes more about the space than the mic. That 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 Rode mic is fine. There's a lot of great mics that can do an ample job of that. The question is the space. The lower the frequency of the instrument you're trying to record, the more the space comes into play. You know, it's just it's just the physics of it. If you don't understand the physics of low energy waves versus high, you should go study that. Um, mm. It'll help you understand the problems of recording low frequency instruments in small spaces. Got it. So the answer there, Max, is just buy a bigger house. Easy one. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, just make sure the player and the microphone are are allowing for as much of the sound to bloom as possible, you know, and that the room is adequate for creating the low frequencies. Uh, you know, there's great charts that you should have at your disposal that show the range of all the musical instruments in frequencies, in terms of frequency range. Mm. And, then, and then just do the physics and, you know, double the length of the waveform and see if there's enough physical space to make the low frequency waves. And if mm. there's not, you're going to have a weird sound. Mm. It's just the nature of the beast. Good point. Physics at play. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, the new question that just came in, can you put something on an Omni mic to get it to behave as a cardioid? That's a great, great question. I want to grab the mic and show you something. You won't hear it, but you just got to trust me. 
So you remember that this omnidirectional mic, even though it looks this way, it did a really good job of hearing me from the back. Everybody remember that when I walked around behind the Omni? Here's the, the funny thing about this Omni mic. Let's just say there was a bunch of people in the room. If you start moving this mic closer and closer to the source, it begins to behave like a cardioid. And let me explain why. Because obviously, as you get closer and closer to the source, what do you think you're going to be doing to the volume uh, of your interface? You're going to be turning it down, right? Because you're getting closer and closer to the source because you don't want to overdrive your input. As you turn down the volume, this side of the mic gets quieter and quieter and quieter until once you're as close as you need to be, this basically behaves like a cardioid. So even though it's got the nice circle on the front saying it's an Omni, if you get really close to the source, it begins to behave like a cardioid. So that's a great question. Oh, cool. Figure of eight mics do the same thing. Uh, figure of eight being a ribbon that has, you can read about it. I think I put a, I, I put a link to a really great article about, uh, about all the patterns for microphones. Okay, cool. Great question though. Yeah. Okay, so we've got a question about the, someone spotted that Shure SM7B uh, yep. in the background. So I guess it's pretty common. So just it's a best great practices. Mic. Uh, there's two problems with this mic. Uh, number one, it takes a pretty good music, uh, a pretty good mic stand to hold it because it's heavy. Uh, so don't put it on a cheap stand or you will have a, a busted mic. It's like my U87. Uh, mm. That does not go on a cheap stand. That goes on a very, very heavy stand. So that's, that's, that's one weird thing. The other weird thing is if you look carefully, the cable is built into it, right? <laughs> and you plug the microphone cable in here. So it's very strange. This wire is, hmm. I mean, who knows? This has been made <laughs> this way for so long. Uh, they're not going to change it now. Now, here's the, that's, that's, there's one other bad thing about it. Just like the ribbon mic, this is very low output. It needs a preamp with tons of gain where you can just crank it up to get enough signal in this. But, but who, whoever has one, I hope you have it because you want to reject everything else in the room. I've heard Dan Lenoir recording. Daniel Lenoir is one of my favorite uh, producing engineers. I've heard recordings the, the Willie Nelson Teatro record, there's a whole band inside of a theater within about 20 feet of each other playing in, in the room loud and Willie singing on an SM7 really close. And Daniel played me some solo bits of this mic solo. You can't even hear the band. And they were cranking. So hmm. the amount of rejection of sounds other than what's right in front of this on this mic is spectacular <laughs> and that's why you see it so much in broadcast because you know the, the announcer guys like right here and whatever else is going on around him we're not hearing so the rejection is its ally it's its biggest thing but you better have a good preamp or you'll never get out of it what you need to and for those of you if you have one uh drop me an email i'll tell you the bigger secret than all that but i don't want to mess with it now it's a thing <laughs> called a cloud lifter but I, you write oh. me a note uh, and the cloud lifter, I'll tell you all about the cloud lifter and uh, I'll change your life in terms of this microphone. It's great. That was actually the follow up question from the student saying they've been using a cloud lifter. <laughs> that's what I use so on the great. ribbon. And that's what I use on the SM7 because it makes them behave almost like a condenser mic. It's ridiculous how nice huh. they, how, how full function they become. I have a cloud lifter right behind this preamp. It's two channel one. There's a two channel one over there. I love them. I use them on SM57s even. That, that, that dynamic mic I had up, you put it on the dynamic mic and it begins to function like a condenser almost. Huh. It's unbelievable. Amazing. So did you say that the ribbon mic is good for saxophones? It's fantastic. It's my very favorite saxophone mic. And also trumpets and trombones and brass instruments. I love the sound of the ribbon. I love it on violin. I love it on any instrument that, that the quality of the instrument is great. Uh, how, do I, how do I politically say this correctly? Uh, if a violin player has a really great instrument, that's a great mic to record them. 
it's like reverb. If it's not a great mm. instrument, well, you're going to need some reverb and a little prayer and maybe a little <laughs> bit of EQ, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you can't make a not great violin sound great, but you can uh, make it sound better. Uh, interesting. Okay, so about uh, questions, specific questions now about the best microphone for operatic singing or the best microphone for the clarinet. I don't know if you have specific recommendations for different uh, clarinet. I, I like uh, small diaphragm condensers, uh, but from about three feet out uh, and stay out of the ligature because there's a lot of buzzing at, at the ligature on a clarinet. So find a place up and down the instrument that's a, a good balanced point, not in the bell, not in the bell, in front of the instrument. Look at where the finger holes are. That's where the sound's coming out. Go kind of again, three to one ratio, build yourself a triangle and get out at least that far. And if the room will allow, go a little further and you'll get a nice balanced clarinet sound. But you need that detail of a, of a small diaphragm condenser to get the best sound. Although, if, if the proximity doesn't allow that, put a ribbon on them. You won't hate it. Ribbons are fantastic. I love them. I use them all the time, but they're a little tricky to use. That particular one, not so much. That's made by Bayer, and it's a it's a forward facing ribbon. So it's a figure of eight, but the back side of the figure eight pattern is inside the barrel, so it doesn't come into play. Um, huh. Whereas most figure eight mics, if it, let's just say this was a figure eight, it's got a, an active side on both sides. Like that eighty seven can be set into figure eight mode, and that's what happens. The condenser, uh, the capsule on the back and the front are active. Hmm. So, can cool. be a little tricky. Okay. Um, I think we've got all the questions now. Uh, right. What mic would you recommend for recording vocals with raw characteristics and soft dynamics? Oh, soft dynamics. Yeah. Uh, 87, something like that. A large diaphragm condenser. Hmm. Male or female? Maybe I should back up. Male or female? Um, guessing female. Female. Female, yeah. Uh, yeah, large diaphragm condenser, um, and if they're if they're if they're loud enough, or you have a cloud lifter, the SM7 is great for that too. Uh, not so much with low level though. Uh, operatic voices. Uh, somebody said operatic voices. Mm. Uh, I love Omni's two and a half feet, three feet in front of the singer, and Omni where you get that big, rich body cavity sound, because classical singers. Whether they're big or small, uh, they use their body cavity way more than pop singers. And if you don't have a mic placement such that the body cavity is in play, you're missing a third or more of their voice. So classical singers, and also I have to be honest, I usually have a, a safety peak limiter on classical singers, uh, hmm. just so they don't kill me. You know, they, they warm <laughs> up and they warm up and everything's good and I get my level set. They start playing, they get to the first section, they blow right through the level they just sang. So uh, a safety net of some sort, either keep the level lower than you think or have a peak limiter in the circuit so that you can uh. tame the, the uh, uh, exuberance of performance. <laughs> yeah, excellent. S same is true of electric guitars though. Electric guitar yeah. player will give you sounds, you know, live pedal board, blah, 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 you get your settings. Get everything all set. You start the song. You play four times louder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. There's so many of these little things. I guess you learn by making a mistake. Yep. It sounds like. Um, so, question about the right mic placement for an upright piano. An upright piano. First of all, strip it. If if you have an upright piano that you want to record, get all the wood you can off of it. The 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 piece of wood underneath the keyboard. That's easily removable. There's usually two little thumb things that you just turn and the whole piece of wood will come off. Uh, take the whole top of the piano back. Um, get as much of the string bed visible as possible. And then two good mics, two good small diaphragm condensers or two good large diaphragm condensers, one on the lower harp, one on the upper harp. You know, mm. it's the best you can do with it. An acoustic upright piano can be just beautiful to record if you take all the wood off of it, take those mm. panels off that are purely decorative and get the harp exposed where the, the big sound of the strings is what we hear. Hmm. Okay, uh, what about pieces where you have a lot of dynamic contrast between the high and low frequencies? It's coming from a flautist. Uh, well, first off, 
recording flute is tricky because you got to get away from the instrument. Uh, then, you know, like this, this particular preamp, which you can't see, I turn the camera off. Um, this particular preamp is made by Millennium Media. Uh, yeah, there it is. Uh, <laughs> it's extremely fast. It's extremely fast and great for flute. And it's also the noise floor is ridiculously low. So for me, recording flute is all about the preamp choice. You know, you just, you know, to get a great flute recording, you really need a great preamp uh, as much mm. as a great microphone. Mm. Okay. And don't be too close. Don't get too close. Great. And then another one, what is the best way to record synthesizers like an MS-20 through an interface or through an amp? Oh, that's a tricky question because if, if, if the amp is integral to the sound you're after, you got to go through the amp. If the uh. amp is just there to make noise, then just go direct. You mm. can always reamp it later through a different setup. Same with guitar. If the if the guitar sound is integral, the, going through the cabinet and the amplifier and and the pedals and all that, if it's integral to the sound you want, then you got to capture the speaker. If not, capture a DI and, and reamp it later. Mm. Or in the case, what I always do, I do both. <laughs> I capture the speaker. At, with the whole the pedal board exactly like they're playing, but also capture the DI so I can go back and reamp it if I if I later on decide that's not working. Wow. Okay. So I, I almost always do both. So then building on that from a bass player, uh, they if they have the option to record DI either mono mono or stereo out of their bass mono, amp. Mono. Mono. Stereo on a bass instrument is darn dangerous. If it's an electric bass with the stereo pickup. It's okay, maybe you could try it. You could experiment with it. If it's an acoustic bass with one of those stereo pickups, I wouldn't use it. I'd go mono. It's just there's no phase cancellation in mono. Mm. <laughs> it's that simple. Mm. You just don't lose a note because it phase cancels itself out in mono, which can happen all the time in stereo. I mean, it sounds weird, but I avoid stereo like the plague except on like mm. marimbas or big physically large instruments, pianos, mm. marimbas, vibraphones, things that are physically big, I record in stereo, but otherwise I avoid stereo like the plague. It's just a nightmare in mix. You're just chasing, constantly chasing phasing problems. Huh. Good to know. All right. I think we have gotten to the end of our questions. Congratulations. You survived like the super lightning <laughs> death round where we throw everything at you at once. Uh, but yeah. I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this. I hope that some of you get garnered some information that you can use. Um, as I said, uh, email me in the next couple of days if you have another question or you want some further looks at something or comments on something. I'll do my best to answer as timely a manner as I can. Uh, Professor Schutz, I can't thank you enough for inviting me to do this. This is right in my wheelhouse. This is what I love to do. I've spent my whole life recording for one reason. I, I never wanted to be an engineer. I'm a performing percussionist. That's what I've always done. But uh, early on, I went into a studio environment and I had these instruments that I had really loved and I would worked my, you know, hard to make sound a certain way. And I played them and I went into the control room and listened and went, that's not what my instruments sound like. What, what, what are you doing? You know, how, and I didn't know anything about recording. I just said, come out here and listen to this thing. And the engineer had never stepped in the room with me. Never. Mm. He hadn't heard a single note played with me playing it. He just came in, he put the mics up and he went in and hit record. And uh. I brought him out and I said, listen to this. This is a, this is a beautiful sounding instrument. Yeah. What happened? You know, uh -huh. and it changed my life. You know, from that point, Nexus, I, I knew the guys and they were in the process of recording their last record because they had met mm. the same challenge over and over and over in the studio. And I said, well, you know, I'm no expert, but I've been for a couple of years now, I've been working on my own projects when I do recording. And I'd love to come up and just give you a hand. Uh, and maybe this last record will be a fun one at least, and you'll find something good. And before the, we did a week of sessions at a studio in downtown Toronto that's no longer there. But before the week was over, we had three more records planned. <laughs> Huh. You know, and uh, 
it, it's just, it, I had started doing this out of necessity. I wanted better sounding recordings, you know. That's interesting. Yeah, I think one of the things that kept coming back to my mind as you were talking is that, you know, learning to become good at doing the recording engineering is in many ways very similar to becoming a good musician. It involves yeah. listening and a lot of practice and experimentation. Yeah, and 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 being kind of uh, fearless about the process, you know, like yeah. knowing when you have to be careful and when you can be fearful, fearless, you know, and and, and kind of evaluating those those uh, that that balancing act of just going for it and going, okay, I got to be careful now, <laughs> you know, this is this is the real deal now. I got to be careful now. I can't blow this one, you know, because that's yeah. what it, that's what it boiled down to for me was like, when can I just dig in and when can mm. I when do I have to just make sure I cover my myself and, and yeah. don't make a too big a mistake? That's fantastic. And I think I know music students, this is a time when we can't do so many of the things, the normal things we'd love to be doing. So it's a great time to take advantage of, you know, whatever mics you got at your disposal, whatever room you're in, play around with different things, record the yeah. same thing four different ways. And we do a project in 2MC3 where you record the same piece in three different spaces and just listen to how it sounds. This is a great time to explore that skill set because it's something you're going to be using throughout the entirety of your careers. Yeah, I mean, even even yesterday or the day before, I can't remember which day I discovered it, but when I was doing, I was thinking about the example I wanted to do of the side addressing the, the, uh, a cardioid, electric cardioid microphone <laughs> just for timbre, just to show timbre shifting. And I was playing my harmonica and I went off, off to off axis response and I went, that's the sound I've always wanted out of this thing, you know? I don't want that sound right up in the front and I don't like it from the side. I like it just off axis, just a little, that's exactly what I've been trying to do for, for years. So uh, again, it was just, I was experimenting to demonstrate something to you, but I found something that I will use, I promise, the next time I record harmonica. I guarantee I learned that setting up for this. <laughs> awesome. You know, so I think it, that's a really inspiring point that someone who's been doing this for that long uh, can learn some new fun things just while setting up this demonstration. Well, thanks again for all your great questions and thanks for taking the time to do that Google Sheet because it helped guide me into the process very clearly uh, in terms of what I wanted to try to cover and how I wanted to try to do it. And I'm sorry it was so fast paced. Believe it or not, your professor first asked me to do this in a 45 minute session <laughs> and I just went, a what? <laughs> really? <laughs> no, I'm not sure I could do it in an hour and a half, but 45 minutes is, <laughs> is, is it's just not going to happen, you know? I, it, it was a 50 minute session, but yes. Okay, yes. 45, yeah. 50, yeah. what's the difference, you know? Yeah. So just a couple of final points as we wrap up. So people are asking about recordings. We'll definitely archive a recording of this and make it available for students. So if you missed the first part or had to leave for the second part, you can capture all that information. Ray's offered generously to answer questions for a 48 hour window from today, not from whenever you watch the video uh, from <laughs> now. So feel free to take advantage of him uh, there and then let me know what you learned because this is amazing stuff and I've learned a lot from this. Yeah, We've also please. dropped. Oh, sorry. I thought oh, I sorry. There's two more links that Ben just dropped into the window. One is that drumming at 50 website that he mentioned. It is an absolutely amazing, comprehensive, uh, 360 degree view of this very important historic piece for us. Um, I also dropped a link into that window of this amazing workshop we ran on March 6th, 2020, where we had the full membership of Nexus here to play different parts of drumming. And I talked about a study that I've been working on uh, for a while now with Ross and Ray, trying to figure out what actually happens when they're doing the phasing. Great. And also Ray's email address is in there. Just a minute Great. Typing. Oh. So I just dropped in a, a link to a percussion group that I, I work with uh, and have been working with for 14 or 15 years now. Uh, in addition to Nexus, JMR Abstract um, was scheduled. We, we're, a, we're a recording only ensemble. We don't tour. We've never toured. We've never uh, played concerts. We just record. And we record in a variety of studios and environments. And we were scheduled to do our first public performance in, in March of 2021. <laughs> Wouldn't you know it? And uh, March 2020. I mean, March of 2020. And of course it got canceled. So we went to work making uh, extremely high quality audio and video projects that we have started releasing on our website, jmr-abstract.com. 
there's some interesting stuff that myself and my colleagues from down in Houston and Oklahoma City have put together. Uh, and all of this was done, everything on the, the current stuff was done in a virtual manner where we were never in the room together. Um, and I, you might find it interesting and you might even find it inspiring just to know that that kind of thing can happen in this in this era you know and that was done most of that really early in the covid era uh right out of the gate we just went okay well we can't do the concert so we're going to do something new and different and uh it's really cool stuff so i encourage everyone to check that out great fantastic okay we'll cut off the recording there before ben's laptop explodes <laughs>